Sunshine Cathedral is a different kind of church where the past is past and the future has infinite possibilities. This is the day our God has made. The wisdom of Elsie McKay. You can never be separated from that which you are, the spiritual essence of you. Jesus healed those who came to him by calling forth the essence of each one, the pure spiritual substance of every atom of being. No matter what untoward circumstance or appearance we go through, we cannot change the essence of our being. It is with us always, and it is good. In these human words, God's voice is heard. Thanks be to God. Please rise as you're able. The wisdom of the Psalter. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before God with joyful song. Know that it is God who made us. We belong to God. We are God's people, the flock. God shepherds. Enter God's gates with thanksgiving and praise. Give thanks to God. Bless God's names. Good indeed is the Lord, whose mercy endures forever. God's faithfulness lasts through every generation. In these human words, God's voice is heard. God. And we continue in the spirit of prayer. We acknowledge your goodness, O God, and we give thanks that you have made us in your good image. Alleluia. Alleluia. Amen. Amen.
please join me in the spirit of prayer. Let us dwell together in peace. And let us not be instruments of our own or others' oppression. And now may God's word be spoken. May only God's word be heard. Amen. Amen. Scott Dittman was invited to a pride parade in Pittsburgh last week. And he had heard about the free mom hugs movement. That's been going on for a couple of years now, where moms show up uh, in gay-friendly spaces with t-shirts saying that they'll give free hugs to people who need them. So he wanted to show up as an ally, and so he thought, you know what, there should be dad hugs too. You know, some people might, might uh, be missing a dad hug. And so he got a t-shirt that said, free dad hugs. And he showed up to the parade, he thought maybe one or two people uh, for, for fun would come up to him and ask for a hug. And uh, anyway, he was there to, to, to be supportive. And he wound up giving over 700 hugs. He said it changed his life. He was amazed at the number of people who would come up to him, a complete stranger, and melt in his arms. He had never quite realized before that how rejected and hurt so many people have been. Well, on this Father's Day, I'm happy to share the story of a dad who offered love to everyone's children at a gay pride event. Why do we still have pride events? That's come up a lot lately. That's social media, uh, people wondering why do we still need them? Are we past all that? Or maybe uh, folks not uh, in the LGBTQ and allied community saying, why do they need uh, pride events? Why, you know, why, isn't pride a, a sin? Isn't pride one of the seven deadly sins? You, please stay away from me with that. Please, don't, no, 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 no. No, sell that mess somewhere else. I'm a, I don't need any of that. So why do we have pride parades? I mean, you know, we've got marriage equality now, for now, and uh, we have, you know, we, we, we're out in the open, we're talking about things. We, we have, uh, uh, it, it's so much better in some ways than it's ever been. Well, part of the reason is because we have spent the last several decades having pride events. Uh, that our pride events are not just parties, they are protests. And they uh, make us be seen and visible and heard and they challenge the norms and, and the status quo. And that has all been to good effect. And that work isn't over. Why do we still have pride parades? Well, well, why isn't a why doesn't every community have a pride parade? Well, almost every community does. I mean, I grew up going to parades. I mean, there was the four states fair parade. We had a parade for four little states that touch corners having an annual fair that, you know, for hillbillies. We had a parade for that. Everyone has a parade. You get to have a parade, organize a parade. Nobody cares, just do it. That isn't a, the question isn't even about the legitimacy of a parade. The question is meant to delegitimize and invisibilize LGBTQ people and those who love them. And because that is the effort, I want three prides a year. In fact, we've had two this year. And so, <laughs> pride events are still necessary because rejection is still destroying lives. And pride is affirmation. Pride is celebration. Pride is empowerment. Pride Month recalls the liberating Stonewall riots where queer people in a bar not only stood up to police brutality, but also stood up to shame and fear and said, enough. We're not gonna hide anymore. We're not gonna hate ourselves anymore. And that story helps us find our voice and the courage to live out loud still. LGBTQ Pride Month, with its themes of empowerment, love, and joy, actually sets the tone nicely for Trinity Sunday. This is Trinity Sunday. This isn't my annual gay pride sermon. That's coming up in two weeks. <laughs> no, this is just the intro to Trinity Sunday. Because really, if we're going to talk about Trinity, you can't talk about that without being a little queer. The whole concept is a queer concept. And so how nice that this year, Trinity Sunday, falls in Pride Month. Trinity Sunday is always the Sunday 
after Pentecost. And luckily, unlike the seven weeks of Eastertide, Trinity is just one day. And I wouldn't want to tackle it any more than that. So I'm glad it just comes around the one time. Because it's a difficult topic, really. Unless you queer it, unless you play with it, unless you let it be fun and uplifting. Because the Trinity is not part of Jewish theology, and yet our scriptures were all written by Jewish people. The person we claim to follow, the person who is our way shower, the person who is our primary symbol of faith, the person who connected many of us for the first time of an awareness of God, that person was till his last breath Jewish. And the Trinity is not a Jewish concept. There's not a clear doctrine of the Trinity in our Bible. But in Deuteronomy, we do read, the Lord our God is one. The Trinity is never, the word Trinity is never even used in Scripture. Which is why, for Trinity Sunday, we read from a psalm. Give praise, rejoice, be glad, enter in the, the court with thanksgiving. We had to pick something because there ain't nothing about the Trinity to choose from. In art... The Trinity is often depicted as two men and a bird. <laughs> Y'all seen it. Now maybe that bird is female. But if there isn't femininity, the image in my opinion is incomplete. The world is full of, of people who identify as male and female, and there are even identities on a spectrum. And we all, no matter how we identify, have some of the other within us. And so the God in whose image we are all made must be all of those things. And if the depictions exclude some of that, it is not a good enough depiction. Reverend Jackie Lewis is the pastor of Middle Collegiate Church in New York City. She wrote, my God is an incarnate feminine power who smells like vanilla and is full of sass and truth, delivered with kindness. She'll do anything for her creation. Her love is fierce. She insists on justice. She is God. She is love. Reverend Lewis's experience of God is missing from an all-male trinity. And hers is a concept of God that needs to be shared. Now, of course, the Trinity for us need not look like two men and a bird. Our Trinity can be more like the vanilla-scented, fierce maternal love described by Jackie Lewis. All God language is metaphorical. None of it is ever good enough. We try to make it grand and beautiful and poetic, and still it does not quite do what we try to do. You can't describe the infinite with finite words. So we see the one God, the Lord your God is one. We see that God in Deuteronomy. We see that God throughout the Bible being experienced in multiple ways. God is in scripture, Lord and mother and father and healer and warrior and provider. And my favorite, rainbow. Ezekiel paints a picture of a rainbow God. I often pray to rainbow God. And we see God as cloud and fire and light and a fortified castle and rock, the very rock from which we are hewn, by the way, Isaiah tells us. And we see God as power in the temple. The God as power was in the Holy of Holies and from that place would pour out to Jerusalem and Israel and the world. We see lots of images, lots of descriptions, lots of explanations or attempted explanations. We see lots of ways of experiencing and exploring God in the scriptures. And all of those things are metaphors pointing toward mystery. And each is a poor substitute for the mystery to which it points. By the year 325, 296 years, almost 300 years after Jesus' death. So three centuries after Jesus, the church codified another metaphor, the Trinity. It wasn't biblical, but why should our metaphors be limited to the first century and before? And while the church eventually took the metaphor too literally, as it is wont to do, the metaphor may still be useful as one possible metaphor among many. And so I would like to offer, fittingly enough today, three reasons the Trinity as a metaphor might still be worth considering. Number one, and maybe this is 
Well, it's hard to rate them, but it's, it's number one on my list today. The Trinity is subversive. That's important in Pride Month, I think. It subverts power systems. Creator, redeemer, sustainer. That's, that's, that's the, uh, the, the gender uh, uh, non-specific, gender inclusive way that we've been saying that for several decades. Creator, redeemer, sustainer. The masks or modes or personas of the Trinity, they work together. The Trinity is power with, not power over. One aspect doesn't boss or bully the others. They are one, united, sharing life together. They are different roles, but they have a unified purpose, and there is harmony in working toward it. There are no power struggles in the Trinity. Power with, not power over. Isn't that the kingdom of God? Which, by the way, was Jesus' preferred metaphor. The Trinity is eternal like a circle without beginning or end. It's circular power, not hierarchical. One power shared by all. It is a subversive divine vision of how things could possibly be. God is good and goodness empowers. It doesn't overpower. The second reason I am starting to find the Trinity to be a useful and powerful metaphor is that the Trinity is relational. How desperate are we for relatedness when 700 strangers will walk up to a man just for a hug? The Trinity highlights communion, or we could say connection. More simply put, the Trinity is relationship. The three aspects are united, connected, flowing into and out of and through one another. The power flows, it is shared, it unites, it brings together, it forms a community, it forms a family, it forms an interconnected whole. A metaphor of God as relationship affirms God's relationship with us. God the creator, that's God for us. Remember, God looks at all of creation and calls it very good. God has created, God now admires the creation. The creator God is God for us. God the redeemer, that's God with us. And the sustainer, that is God in us. God for us, God with us, God in us. We are part of that relational God, God for us, with us, in us. The Trinity is a reminder that there's not a spot where God is not. A good God will not and cannot abandon us ever. God is forever offering mom hugs and dad hugs, leaving no one out. And the third reason why I think the Trinity might still be a useful metaphor for us if we want to try it on is that the Trinity is a source of joy. So many of us left religion because it was angry. And I don't mean righteous indignation where we're, where we're trying to fight injustice and we do so even with laughter. No, it was angry and fear-based, telling us why we weren't good enough and why God was angry with us or why God required something really drastic and torturous in order to be able to accept us at all. We were given language and narratives and stories and symbols and images that made God anything but good and us just barely accepted. And so we just decided we couldn't live with that burden and we left. But that was a misrepresentation because the Trinity is joy. If the religion that we experienced wasn't joyful, it wasn't the right kind. The Trinity is joy. Wherever there are three, there's a party. <laughs> Growing up in the South, the mean old Baptists and Pentecostals, they would call Anglicans Whiskey Palians. <laughs> because they said, wherever you find four Episcopalians, you'll find a fifth. <laughs> Shows what they know. I don't even like brown liquor. But, but three, that's a party. The creator, God for us, looks at creation and calls it good, takes pleasure in it. The Redeemer, God with us, 
gathers us around tables to share food and drink and companionship and prayer and hope and love. The Redeemer aspect of God is at Passover feasts and at the Eucharistic meal and at the Feast of Weeks and at the summer barbecue and at the Memorial Day picnic and at the pride events afterwards at Rosie's. God is at the table. God is in the meeting places. God is at the party. And the sustainer, God in us, gives us gifts. It's the kind of party that you bring gifts to, and the gifts are for you. God gives us gifts and helps us bear good fruit in our lives. If religion has made you hate yourself, or fear God, or reject others because of what they call God, or who they love, or, or how they, what gender they tell you they are, and it's for them to tell you, you don't get to tell them, then you've missed the point. God as Trinity is joy. Not condemnation, not fear, not hatred, not aggravation. God as Trinity is joy. God is at the parade. God is at the celebration. God is looking at our lives and seeing something good. If religion made you mean, bitter, or afraid, you're not doing it right. And if anyone has used religion as a weapon against you, they weren't doing it right. <laughs> Trinity is joy. There's a creation myth that isn't in our Bible because the Trinity really isn't in our Bible, but there is a, there is a creation myth that involves the Trinity. And so it, was, it came much later, but I do like it. The story says that the Trinity loved to play. Oh, a playful deity, isn't that wonderful? And even in Proverbs, we see wisdom saying that she is God's playmate. And so yes, this playful deity. So the legend says that the Trinity, the playful Trinity, was dancing one day, just dancing. Just dancing around and around like at a tea dance, you know, like Trinities do. <laughs> and that circular power, that love and expression, that relational impulse, that Trinity, they were just dancing, dancing feverishly. And it got so ecstatic that there was an explosion, an emission, if you will. An explosion of pure delight. They danced and they sweated and they laughed until a big old mess was made. An explosion. And the fallout from that explosion is creation. According to that parable, creation, and that includes you and me, creation is the manifestation of divine joy. God is good and goodness is joyful. If the Trinity, as one of several metaphors for God, can help you resist systems of domination and oppression, if it can help you experience and celebrate God in your life, God for you, God with you, God in you, if the Trinity, as a metaphor for God, can give you permission to experience and share joy, then why not give it a whirl? But if you're like I was for so long, and you just can't with the Trinity right now, that's okay too. There are other symbols. There are other metaphors for God. Just don't over-literalize any of them, including the Trinity. But whatever metaphor you work with and play with, let it be a constant reminder of this. God is good. And this is the good news. Amen.
things be as they speak wordlessly from the mystery of what they are. Simply to say a silent yes to the hillside flowers, to the trees we walk under, to pass from one person to another a morsel of bread, and answering yes. This is the simplest, the quietest of sacraments. As, As we share bread and cup, we remember, we remember Jesus. And we experience communion with the divine. And so it is. Here at the Sunshine Cathedral, we practice an open communion. What that means is that you don't have to be a member of this church or of any church to receive this sacrament. Just as you are, with whatever your beliefs or your doubts may be, you are welcome to participate in this feast of unconditional love. My friends, these are the gifts of God for all the people of God. Thanks 